made it back on the third verse. I must be getting faster or something. <laughs> All right. Let's take our uh, Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We are in Acts chapter 22 tonight, looking at resume and revolution. Acts chapter 22. Last week we finished up Ephesians, Greeks, Egyptians, and Murder, part three, and learned the last three lessons, lessons eight through ten, that we pick up out of that passage, some very important things. Lesson number eight, when authority responds properly to public panic, order is restored, lives and property are protected, and the law is upheld. And we tend in our day and age to think anything that deals with governmental authority is probably bad. And that's a rather dangerous kind of an outlook because that's what sets the, the tenor uh, for government to be bad. They say, okay, everybody's in rebellion. Uh, we're going to finally come and put a big squash on it. But when believers look at government the way God intended it to be looked at, even if it's bad government, God tends to restrain the government. So lesson eight was when authority responds properly to public panic, order is restored, lives and property are protected, and the law is upheld. And we saw that in verses 32 through 34 of chapter 21, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing and some another in the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And so uh, Peter had also discussed that. We had gone over several passages in First and Second Peter uh, where, you know, you've heard the old saying, your actions speak louder than your words. Well, in this kind of a context, your actions speak louder than their words. And that's what we see the Apostle Paul dealing with here. Uh, usually you get that quoted to you. Uh, to keep you from being a hypocrite, but Peter puts it in a different context. He puts it in the context of sin and suffering. Your actions speak louder than their words. When Peter writes, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. This is not your home. You know that? You know the song. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. We've gotten to the point where we feel quite at home in this world. But this world is not our home. We are strangers and pilgrims. The scripture tells us that. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, you do it openly, you do it publicly. Glorify God in the day of visitation. And that's why he goes on and says, Submit yourselves, the very next verse, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of them that do well. Every ordinance of man. Do you like every ordinance that's out there? How many of you all like the speed limit ordinances on roads where you know you can go 40 to 45 miles an hour and it's 25 miles an hour? Do you like those? <laughs> Nobody's wiggling their head one way or the other. Okay. How about the ones that say you're not supposed to text while you drive? You're not supposed to talk on your cell phone while you drive? It's a tough one, isn't it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those are great ordinances. <laughs> those, those are great ordinances. The question is, do you feel that way when suddenly your cell phone rings and you're driving? <laughs> hmm. Have you gotten to the point where you're using Bluetooth? Because that's okay as long as you've got both hands on the wheel. <laughs> you can talk to the phone and, and you can tell the phone to call a number. My, my son has one of those where he doesn't even have to take his hands off the wheel. He just says, turn on. And when he says those words, the thing comes on. And he says, call so-and-so, and it actually recognizes his voice, and it calls so-and-so, and he can keep on talking just like the person was sitting right there next to him. Well, that's fine. That's perfectly legal. But if you've got it in your hands, we don't always like every ordinance that man gives, do we? How about the tax ordinances? How about the, uh, we're coming up to April, not too long from now, uh, how about that sales and use tax thing? 
Do you keep records of everything you buy over the Internet or everything that you buy out of state? You go over to Philadelphia and you purchase something and bring it back, and um, tax level is 1% less, or if you're in several states, it's 3 to 4% less, and you got it and only paid 3 to 4%, and you're supposed to figure out the difference in tax, and even though New Jersey could never catch you, they probably couldn't. And you're betting on that. You're supposed to figure out the extra 3% and put it down and send it in. Do we like those things? It's not a matter of liking it. It's a matter of doing what God said. Every ordinance of man. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. There is somebody who keeps records and he's accurate. Whether it be to the king is supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. You know, people say, man, I really wish I knew God's will. And usually when we say that, we're saying, I sure wish I knew God's will about, like, what job to take, or what person to marry, or what this, or what that. Did you follow all the passages that tell you what the will of God is right now that he has revealed? If you haven't, don't expect revelation on something else if you're not obeying what God has already told you is his will. This is the will of God. And there's a reason for it, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see, when we obey government as it being the will of God, what we do is we shut the mouths of those who criticize Christ. As free and not using your liberty, because in Christ you are free. But the Lord Jesus Christ, when Peter came up to him and said, say, do we pay the temple tax? Jesus said, you know, uh, tell me, um, the kings of the earth, who pays taxes to them, the general public or their own children? They said, well, the general public. Jesus said, and then are the children free? But he says, so that we do not offend them. Go pay it, and here's how you'll do it. Go down to the lake, throw in your line, you're going to pull up a fish. When you open the fish's mouth, there will be a piece of money. Go pay the tax for you and for me. Jesus is God. And he provided to pay the tax so that Peter would not stumble, so that people wouldn't say Jesus didn't pay his taxes, so that you and I would not have an excuse. The children are free, but we do it as a testimony to those who are lost. Very important. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Four things you're commanded. We'll not go over them all again tonight. When we function that way, we destroy the anti-Christian arguments of the God-haters. Respect for others, love for believers, the highest proof of our love for God, giving deserved honor, because God says it's deserved to our civil rulers. It's the proof of our love for God by loving each other that silences the opposition. We talked about that out of John chapter 13 and 1 John chapter 3. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another in the same manner in which Jesus loved us. That's a pretty big charge. Husbands are supposed to love their wives. Nobody expects that. But that's how we are supposed to love the other Christians, some of whom are not so cool. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, 1 John 3. We know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know, I, I really love the other Christians, but I just really can't stand them. <laughs> right. If that's the way you think, it says you abide in death. It's one of the three proofs given in 1 John for a person who's truly saved. There are three indicators in 1 John that prove both to you and to everybody else that you are saved or you are not saved. We've covered that. We'll not go over it again. Lesson number nine was when you're in the center of the will of God, you can expect his protection even through the agency of human government. That's why God put government there. And it will be for the purpose of accomplishing God's final will. We don't like government, but government, even bad governments, are ordained by God. According to Romans chapter 13, when it's time to go to heaven, God will take you. Nothing can stop you from getting there. 
and when somebody wants to send you there in advance it won't happen unless God wills it we find that in Acts 21 35 through 38 and that's why Paul had courage why he was willing to stand on the stairs and preach lesson number 10 when you're falsely accused respond quietly you know most of the time we get falsely accused we tend to get our hackles up don't we somebody makes some kind of an off-the-wall accusation I had a guy do that to me yesterday and he was really in my face and really ugly and somebody who has absolutely no authority at all around here and he got in my face and started accusing me of stuff and I could feel my blood pressure going up I could feel my face flushing uh, you know I, I could feel you know anger coming as to who does this guy think he is telling me what to do and telling me that I need to be monitored all the time somebody with absolutely no authority and then it turned out after he finally told me what he was talking about and I explained he might have had nothing to do with that he said oh but did he apologize no but you know what we see with Paul he's being falsely accused here it's a good lesson because you know we all face that kind of petty stuff every day now it wasn't so petty with Paul they're gonna kill him <laughs> that's a little more than petty <laughs> but look how he responded here when you're falsely accused respond quietly articulately without panic and remember that God is still in control give the facts not opinion or emotions Paul demonstrated the principle expounded it theologically in first Thessalonians 4 verse 11 that you study to be quiet to do your own business to work with your own hands as we commanded you in other words mind your own business and do what you've been called to do don't worry about everybody else mind your own business do what you're called to do and don't worry about what everybody else is doing we reach that calm equilibrium by prayer and absolute faith in the sovereignty of God I exhort therefore the first of all supplications prayers intercession and giving of thanks be made for all men you start there four different types of prayer are listed in first Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 and where are we supposed to start you start at the top and you work down for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior you want to know the will of God follow the passages that tell you what the will of God is and then God will reveal to you his will in other areas where he has not typed it out in black and white but obey the ones that you know this that is praying for those in authority over you with supplications prayers intercession and giving of thanks for it's good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior and we talked about that last week God is our Savior he can control and we saw that in the life of that young teenage Virgin Mary with the greatest crisis situation in her life no one in the history of the entire world had ever faced the crisis that she was going to go through because she had absolute faith and confidence that God was her Savior she made it she made it and you will make it too if you have that same kind of faith and confidence Mary said my soul doth magnify the Lord my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior and that brings us to our text tonight which is Acts chapter 22 beginning a new chapter tonight starting in verse 1 here's Paul standing on the stairs he's raised his hands he starts speaking in Hebrew and everybody is very very quiet <laughs> a Roman prisoner standing on the stairs of the Antonia fortress overlooking the temple courtyard and talking in Hebrew that's a first men brethren and fathers hear ye my defense which I make now unto you and when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them they kept the more silence and he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus the city of Cilicia yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel now if you have studied anything about Jewish history and I know I've said this before but you may not have picked it up Jews uh, classify and categorize their ancient famous rabbis there's Hillel, there's Shammai, and so on. And they've got, there's Maimonides. I mean, there are all kinds of them. And there are seven of them that are called Ramban. That is the greatest title you can get. Gamaliel was one of the seven greatest Rambans in all of Jewish history. And he was Paul's personal teacher. We're going to talk about resumes here in just a second. Because tonight it's Resumes and Re Revolution. Paul had an impeccable resume 
and he is spreading it out in front of a Jewish audience. Those who have been about to kill him suddenly are discovering, whoa, this is one of those those rabbinic students of Gamaliel? Brought up in this city, that is in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. In other words, hey, you guys are right. You're supposed to be zealous for God. I mean, this afternoon, I, I was just sort of lounging on my bed listening to beautiful music and, and reading some passages out of Leviticus, which where, where they're supposed to stone people to death for all kinds of stuff, one of which is blaspheming God. And so here are these zealous people. I mean, they think the Paul's defiled the temple. They're going to stone him. Fascinating passages. Boy, you read, you read about it. You read all the different things. There are nine people in Scripture that got stoned. And uh, we'll not go over all of them here, but, but there are specific reasons God gave for stoning people. And these people were zealous for God. Paul acknowledges that. Now he understands that they don't know what they're doing, that they've made some false premises, but they're zealous for God. There are a lot of people who do that. They're zealous for God. They don't know what they're doing. They've got some false premises, but they are sure trying to obey God all that they can by what they know. Unfortunately, most of us know an awful lot more than we're zealous for. You're zealous toward God as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Was Paul zealous for God? I think it's obvious he was. He thought, we got a group of heretics here, we've got to dig them out, we got to get rid of them, they're ruining Judaism. He killed them. As also, and by the way, that's part of his resume. He's going to talk about that later. As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders. Remember, he had letters from the high priest when he went to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, and when he was struck down by light on the Damascus road, and Jesus spoke to him out of the Shekinah glory. The high priest knew who Paul was because the high priest had actually written letters and given them to Paul, giving him authority. Paul never moved without authority. We have a lot of folks here who do all kinds of things sua sponte, that is, on their own motion. They just assume authority and do them. You know, this morning as I was preaching and I was thinking about the message and then this afternoon as I was thinking about certain things that have happened uh, over the last two or three months here, I thought, you know, we're like the days of the judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, it just assumes authority, just does, because they think it needs to be done, I'm going to do it. Don't bother to find out whether or not they should, whether or not there was a different plan on the agenda. America is very much like the book of Judges. The church in America is very much like the book of Judges. Every man does that which is, is right in his own eyes. Not what is requested or required, but what he thinks he wants to do, regardless of what everybody else thinks. Uh, illustrations we have living. High priest doth bear me witness in all the estate of the elders from whom I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them with uh, them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. There are penalties for doing wrong, and God will make sure the penalty is carried out. If you refuse the warnings over and over and over again, God himself, we talked about that this morning, the chastening hand of the Lord will be punished. It came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I say, now look, we've already heard that story. He could have just said, look, I had this light shine from heaven in Damascus. If you want to find out about it, talk to Luke. He's going to write the book of Acts, and he'll tell you all about it. <laughs> he didn't say that. We have a complete recount in Acts chapter 22 of what happened on the Damascus road. You know, when God says something once, he wants you to know it. <clears throat> he expects you to know it. He expects you to respond to it with obedience and in a way that brings him glory. 
But when he says something twice and doesn't just say it in a pithy little sentence, like in the Proverbs, you find a couple of the Proverbs are, you know, you'll find them twice, but they're only half a verse long or a verse long. But when he gives two entire chapters to precisely the same thing, it means that he wants you to learn something important out of it. And so Paul is recounting the entire event. Suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? Paul knew the Shekinah glory. He'd never seen a light like this before, but he'd certainly read everything about it in the Old Testament. Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, Here's the resident, the dweller of the Shekinah glory, always the one who is speaking from the Shekinah glory. As he spoke to Abraham in Exodus chapter 3, so he speaks to Paul in, in Acts chapter 9. And Paul recounts it. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake unto me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus. Well, I'm on my way to Damascus. Yeah, but you were on there for the wrong purposes. You know, many times we're on our way to do something and it's the wrong purpose and suddenly we realize that God has a different plan for our life. He might still want us to be heading in the direction we're heading, but our purpose changes entirely. We get into something for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motive, because we want to get something out of it. And we suddenly realize our motive was wrong. It doesn't mean that always we have to go back. It means we have to change our motive and our purpose. That's what happened to Paul. He'd headed to a particular destination. He would changed locations for one particular purpose. He was going to arrest Christians and throw them in the clink. God said, you're still going to go to Damascus, but I have a different plan for you. When you get there, you're going to be blind, and you're going to spend some time blind realizing just how serious what you were doing was. And then I got some training for you before I send you out to serve me. Some training that you're going to have to learn before you go out and suddenly become the greatest missionary the world has ever seen. Oh, how God takes our directions and sometimes he changes the direction and revolutionizes his life and turns it around and goes the other direction. Sometimes he says, keep going where you're going, but I'm going to change what you're going to do. And that's what happened here with the Apostle Paul. Arise and go into Damascus and there shall be told thee all the things which are appointed for thee to do. God gave him information one step at a time. God didn't say to him, look, go to Damascus. And when you get to Damascus, here are the 47 things that are going to happen. And then from Damascus, here are the 45 things that are going to happen after that. And then from there, you're going to get arrested in Jerusalem, which is happening today. And then from there, it's going to take... God didn't tell him that. Our responsibility is to obey what God gives us today. A minute ago, we were talking about knowing and doing the will of the Lord. You will never know the will of the Lord in areas where it's not a specific verse in Scripture until you obey the specific verses of Scripture. For example, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. God has revealed specific things in His Word, and He tells us, this is my will. And so what we do is we say, okay, let's categorize all of those. And I've been through a category. I hope some of you take notes and some of you remember the things, because I give you lists. I do the research, I write everything down, I give it to you point by point by point by point, and if you take the points down, you can go back and you see, oh, there's that category. Here are all the passages that say, this is the will of God, where he lists his specific will for us. Now, have I got those 32 different things down in my life? Am I obeying those? Why should I ask him about this over here until I obey what he's already told me I'm supposed to do? Do you take notes? I wish you would. You'll find it's very beneficial. You'll find down the road that you're going to need it. You're going to say, man, I remember Pastor Spencer talked about that on one occasion. But, man, I sure don't remember what he said because, you know, well, I was thinking about fixing lunch or I was thinking about what I'm going to have to do this week or I was thinking about a problem that I got at home. 
This is the will of God. Did you know the Bible says this is the will of God that you should take notes when the preacher? No, I didn't. <laughs> well, let's go on. And when I could not see for the glory of the light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. Interesting to whom God sent Paul. Now, Paul was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles, but God didn't send him to a Gentile believer. God didn't just send him to a wishy-washy Jew. God didn't send him to somebody who was sort of a compromiser and got along with everybody on all sides and, you know, kind of smooth guy. And, you know, he could, he could handle it by having this, this Jewish zealot as well as he could handle some drunken Greek walking in the door. It says he sent Paul to Ananias, a devout man, according to the law. It's part of Paul's resume. Paul went to Damascus and went specifically to the house of Judas on the street called Straight, and then God told Ananias, go and talk to Paul. And Ananias objected. Ananias said, Lord, I've heard about Paul. I know what kind of a guy he is. He wasn't ignorant. He wasn't green behind the ears. Sometimes God will call you to do something that you're scared to do. Do you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to obey. There is no argument with God. Every time we do, we get into trouble. Our job is to obey and leave the results to God. He came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will. Do you think God wants you to know his will? We've been talking about that here. God wants you to know and obey his will more than you want to know and obey his will. Let me say that again. God wants you to know and obey his will more than you want to know and obey his will. Now, in that contest, tell me who's going to win. You know, we can either know the will of God and obey it cheerfully and willingly, or God will beat it into us. He will drag us through the judgmental blindness period, which we've been talking about this morning, where we're all panicky, we're all worried, we're all, all frustrated, we're going through pain and suffering, not realizing that it is the loving hand of God that is chastening us so that we will be in the center of His will. That He's actually blessing us as we go through that. But we don't see it. The God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. That's what he heard Jesus on the road to Damascus. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, you remember when we were back in Acts chapter 2 and we were talking about baptism and all the different types of baptism that show up in the Bible. There are six different types of baptism that are mentioned in Scripture. I mean, everything from the baptism of John to the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of Jesus by John, the baptism of Jesus that he didn't do any, and that the disciples baptized, and how did they baptize, and what modes did they use, and is meaning more important than mode? And You know, I went through a whole thing on that, and we talked about this passage there, and maybe we'll talk about it again when we get a little farther, because there are new people here. We're not going to talk about it tonight, though. What does it mean to be baptized and wash away your sins? Is that baptismal regeneration? They're Church of Christ people say, you see here, when you get wet in one of our tanks with one of our preachers using a specific formula, and you get dunked backwards and not forwards, because there are some people who do backwards immersions once. There are some who do them thrice in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And there are some who baptize you forward. And I read a doctrinal statement just a couple of days ago by some group that said, if you've been baptized forward, you've got to be baptized by us again backwards. And if you've been baptized three times backwards, you have to be baptized by us again one time backwards. Bizarre. You don't find that in the scripture. But anyway, we're not going to talk about baptism tonight. That's a fun subject, but we're not going to talk about it tonight. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. 
Ah, so we're now suddenly up to the same date that he is standing there talking to them. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. Now, interesting. God didn't tell him to get out of Jerusalem until he'd already been there and had already done what was necessary to fulfill his vows. Remember, he had to go with these other Jewish men who had a Nazarite vow on them into the temple, and they had to go through a very specific process, burning their hair and all kinds of other stuff, uh, to complete their vow. And Paul was doing it according to the law, even though he wasn't under the law, but he'd made a vow while he was under the law, which indicates that if you make a vow, even if you've made a vow before you were saved, you need to fulfill it. For example, marriage vows. An unsaved person gets married to an unsaved person, and then they get saved, and they say, ah, oh, must dissolve my vow, right? No, it doesn't dissolve your vow. You're still married to that person. Paul deals with that issue over in 1 Corinthians chapters 5, 6, and 7. But God revealed to him he's in the temple. Did he not move fast enough? And saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And Paul stopped to argue. When God tells you to do something, you better do it quickly. You better not putter around at it. Paul started to argue. He said, I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. That was also part of Paul's resume, not a part that he was proud of. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now, the time that it takes in those three little verses were apparently the time that it took for the Jews from Asia to recognize Paul and start the riot. You know, I told you this morning about, about the little pauses in time that sometimes save our lives and, and how within the last couple of weeks I was driving and I'd looked both ways on a street and I pulled out and didn't see a car. I don't know where it came from, but it almost hit me. And I mean, if I had another coat of paint on the car, it would have hit me. Uh, you know, timing in the plan of God is very precise, like with Ahab and the arrow that hit the chink in his armor as though the archer had aimed for it and Ahab was standing very, very still and the archer was a really good archer and he kabang got him right in the in the crack in the armor. You better not delay when God tells you to do something. You better not argue with him. You better not putter around. You better not be a sluggard and a sloth. There are consequences for it. Now Paul's making the best of the situation that he's got here. But how long did it take me to read those verses? You know, a few seconds can make the difference in life and death. Now God's sovereign, we know that. He'll take you when he's going to. But at the same time, you and I are responsible for immediate obedience. I saw him saying unto me, Make haste. Now, come on, move it, Paul. Get thee quickly out of Jerusalem for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Now, Paul's going to get it, give his testimony, but he's under arrest while he's doing it. And are they going to receive his testimony? Well, you know from the later part of the passage, no, they don't. God's still going to accomplish his purposes through Paul, but Paul's going to have to take a little different route because God had told him to get out of Jerusalem. God would have provided a different means to accomplish the purposes. You know what? You can never get away from the will of God. You will do what God wants you to do, whether you like it or not. And it will either be in a way that God has designed, which is pleasant, or it will be in a way which God says, well, you didn't obey me as quickly as I said you should, and so you're going to have to pay the penalty. You'll still end up doing what I want you to do. You may have to go through a period of judgmental blindness. You may have to suffer a little bit just so that you will learn that next time when I tell you to do something, you do it immediately. You know, that's, that's one of the lessons that we had to teach our kids. Obey now. Not obey later. Not obey after you've done what you wanted to do. Not argue with me about what you're going to do. Do it when I tell you to do it. I heard a true story from the mission field not, oh, perhaps 20 years ago. 
and uh, was missionary parents who had a little boy, a small child. And they had taught him the principle of immediate obedience. And the little boy was out in the yard playing one day. They were in the Orient somewhere. I think it was Indonesia, but I'm not quite sure. And uh, the father looked out and he yelled at the little boy, drop to the ground and crawl to me as fast as you can. The little boy didn't just look at him dully. The little boy didn't sort of say, well, I'm running. The little boy dropped to the ground and crawled as fast as he could away. When he got over there, the father pointed back the tree above where the little boy was, there was a boa constrictor that had been reaching down to get the little boy. Immediate obedience is what God requires. You don't argue with him. You don't put it off. You don't do your own thing first. Paul gives us a good illustration of that, I think, here in this passage. He wants to argue. He says, look, they know how bad I am. They already know part of my resume. They're not going to give me grief. Well, I'll have a great open door to them because I'll say, look, that's the way I was and now look at me now. I've been changed. God had told him, I'm not going to listen to your testimony. Get out of here now. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. The last words that Jesus spoke to Paul before he went through the beating process. And they gave him audience unto this word and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from off the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Do you understand how bad the Jews hated the Gentiles? <laughs> and the, the Datiim, the Orthodox Jews, still do. You and I are scum to them, worse than scum. And as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air. They've been listening to him because he's talking Hebrew. He'd given them part of his resume, the part that they should have appreciated very much. But they sure couldn't tolerate that business of God telling him to go to Gentiles. I mean, God had revealed in the Old Testament that the Gentiles were slime balls. They weren't about to take that. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would never love a Gentile. At least so they thought. Immediate obedience. Well, we have a number of lessons that we can learn from this. Lesson number one. A resume may gain you a hearing, but it will not ultimately win over a hostile audience. That's obvious from the text. His resume gained him a hearing. He started it out in Hebrew. Hey, the guy speaks Hebrew. He's not talking to us in Aramaic, the, the trade language. He's not talking to us in Latin. He's not talking to us in the intellectual language of Greek. He's talking Hebrew. He speaks it pretty good, too. Why, well, he's got his grammar right. He's got his vocabulary right. He knows how to talk Hebrew. You got their attention. But you know, it didn't necessarily win a hostile audience. But you know, without the resume... You may not get a hearing. You say, I don't need a resume. I don't need to let people know what I've learned, what I've studied. I don't need to let people know what, what my background is. I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to be a lot for Jesus. Without the resume, you may never even get the hearing. You know, I've often had the opportunity of telling young men who are eager for ministry that this is one of the reasons why it's important to go through the discipline of training. And I've, I've had the opportunity, not here, we don't have any young men. But I've had the privilege in many other places and in different churches in which I've served of being able to minister to a lot of young men. And a lot of them are eager for serving Christ. And I've told them why it is important to go through the discipline of training. There are too many men who simply want to jump into the ministry without ever, and here's the, the boogie word, without ever submitting to the strenuous regimen of the biblical languages, of systematic theology, historical theology, practical theology, research, writing, the intellectual challenge of being stimulated by others who are training for the ministry, the blunt challenge of teachers who poke holes in your crummy little arguments, 
the humiliation of having your sermons recorded and then being critiqued by your classmates and professors. That's what they do in seminary. You get up and you preach your sermon in front of a camera, and then afterwards, they show the camera again to the whole class who's heard you preach the sermon, and as they go through, the professor will stop the camera and say to everybody, now what's wrong with what he just said? And you're sitting there, and all the guys around you are telling what's wrong with what you just said. Teach a little humility. Not to be pompous when you stand up in the pulpit and you're pontificating about all your cool theories. Just yesterday, in fact, someone asked me about a program being offered by a small fundamental Baptist church in Texas that offers bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and doctoral degrees. A little arrogant, but it's totally unaccredited. The degrees are recognized by nobody else. The so-called school does not list their faculty. The so-called school does not list the qualifications of their faculty. But in the end, they'll give you a diploma that says you are a doctor of theology. Cool. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of these uh, diploma mills out there on the Internet, too. Um, there's one out there. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's been under investigation by the IRS. They'll give you all kinds of degrees, and uh, you just have to send them a certain amount of money, and they'll send you the degree. Years ago, while I was still in college, and before I went to seminary, I worked one summer at the Hemisphere Service for Science, and the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus was in town. And there is a museum, actually, Ringling Brothers Museum in San Antonio with big stone elephants out in front. Very interesting place to go visit. You can see the memorabilia of Tom Thumb and all those, you know, famous circus entertainers that are there. But the circus was actually in town, and a guy from the circus who worked in taking care of some of the maintenance of tiger cages and things like that. Um, he came through our pavilion, and he was really excited about it, and so he thought he'd do me a favor. And so he went online, not online, back in those days it couldn't be online, but, but he, he went and wrote to and got from them a diploma for me, <laughs> giving me ordination and some kind of a degree, which I don't even remember what it was, and was all pleased that he could give this to me thinking that would be what made me a minister. Folks, I don't even remember the name of the so-called school, a diploma mill. I heard later that they were under investigation by the IRS. There's a problem with that. Paul had a real resume. Paul had real training. Paul could point to his teacher one of the seven greatest rabbis in all of Jewish history. He had a resume. And it was worth something. It wasn't the fly-by-night program. You see, the problem is that groups like that are holding themselves out as an authority when they have no authority. They're producing graduates who have fat heads because they have a diploma that proves nothing but says that other people should call them doctor. There's no recognizable external standard by which they are held accountable. No external standard by which their quality can be tested. Paul was a highly trained theologian. That has something to say about this kind of patting yourself on the back approach, and Paul talks about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 7 and following. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? The guys running around out there, they've all got to all kinds of outward appearance stuff. If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him think himself again this, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ's. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, and Paul certainly could, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and speech contemptible. And <laughs> Paul was a little teeny runny guy, but he had authority. He knew what he was talking about. He had gone through the regimen, the discipline of training, and he had divine authority that God gave to him after he had done it. Let such a one think this, that such as we are by word and letters, when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. Now verse 12, here's the key verse. 
For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But measuring themselves by themselves, <laughs> Hey, let's look at us four. We're all pretty good, aren't we? Yeah, you're, you're pretty good. And Hey, you're pretty good. How about me? Yeah, you're pretty good too. I'll call you doctor if you'll call me doctor. They, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. That's Paul's take on it. On all the diploma mills which is an application of the principles that we see here. You see, it goes back to something that's very important that the church today, by a large part, has forgotten. Submission to the authority of others is a very difficult challenge for some men because submission requires humility. And pride in natural gifts and spiritual gifts makes them think that they can succeed without the hard work required. There are some people who are truly talented. God has given them many, many physical gifts. He's given them many spiritual gifts. But they have never developed them the way God wants them to be developed. They've never gone through the hard work of submitting to authority by those who are older and wiser and who have been through the mill, and who have been trained themselves, and who have knowledge and wisdom passed down from generation to generation to generation. They've never gone through the hard work required, the discipline required, the quiet humility of listening to the reasoning and teaching of others whom they may think don't know as much as they do. I've run into so many young men who really think that I've not thought through certain things. They want to argue with me. I'll listen to them. I'll say, have you considered this one? No, I never thought about that. Do you understand that if you do this, this is what happens? I'll give you some illustrations. Oh, I didn't know that. They start out by telling me how much they know when they don't know squat. The disciples had the very best teachers who put them through their paces for three years, the Lord Jesus. And as a result, ignorant fishermen Peter and John had an impressive resume. Listen to what it says about them in Acts chapter 4. And Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were the kindred of the high priest, these were the big shot theologians in Jerusalem, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, By what power, by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined for the good deed done to the impotent man, in other words, he gets to the point, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, he wasn't scared, he didn't pull any punches, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, quoting the Old Testament. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now here's the key verse, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. It was only a three-year seminary course get a Master of Theology today, it takes four years. You get a Master of Divinity in three years. But you know, I suspect that what the disciples got in their three years was better than a Master of Divinity, a Master of Theology, a Doctor of Theology, a Doctor of Philosophy, a Doctor of Divinity, a Doctor of Literature, all the different degrees and all those different letters that you can stick after your name. And <laughs> I was recently looking at a, a fellow who um, is the president of a particular seminary where the seminary has granted him a string of about seven different degrees He's the head of the school, and yet he's got his degrees from that school. <laughs> so he has all these degrees after his name, which he didn't earn anyplace else. Jesus was their personal teacher, just like Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. That was lesson number one. can't believe we haven't even gotten to lesson number two. <laughs> lesson number two is an important lesson, so I'm not going to start it tonight. We'll have to wait till next week. But I tell you, just having a resume isn't enough. You can have the best resume in the world. 
Paul had it, but it isn't enough. There's something else that must also take place. We'll talk about that next week. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We pray that you'll help us to understand, as we've looked at something we all do understand, resumes, and putting that into a spiritual context, understand how it's to be applied to our lives in terms of immediate obedience and service for Christ. The discipline, the humility of going through the training process so that we might most perfectly fulfill what you have given to us. Not just students who are monitoring the class, but those who are <laughs> taking notes and learning, memorizing, studying, cross-referencing scripture, writing things out, making sure that if someone asks us on the spur of a moment about a particular thing, even if we don't have it memorized, we can flip open our Bible because we've got stuff written in the notes, along the margins. We know where a key passage is, and we've written down all these references in the margins so that we can go from there and take them through, logically, step by step, the doctrinal issues with which they're wrestling. Father, there's a reason for us being here learning the specific things that you have given to this preacher to preach. Because you have a purpose for us in knowing those things, not really in showing up for church, so we can say we went to church and have our conscience eased. Oh Lord, help us. Help us to be diligent. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be here to hear everything, not just some of the stuff. Father, we pray for your blessings on the message tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if I can find my hymnal, there it is. Let's turn to number two.